Now go. Oh, keep going. Okay. Thanks. All right. So hold on to that question for just a second because it will continue to be important. So I always like to start this um, start presentations with a couple of kind of grounding or you know philosophical thoughts. And these are two of my favorite quotes um, to sort of keep in mind as we go uh, through this. All organizations are perfectly aligned to get the results they get. That doesn't mean there's an organization that is without error, without risk, without problems, without crises. But when those things happen, how does the organization respond? What do they do with it? An organization's alignment determines how effectively they'll be able to handle that undesirable situation. And as we'll talk about later with the concept of resilience engineering, what resilience really is, is getting from bad back to good. So an organization's alignment determines how effectively they can get from bad to good. Now, part of the thing is both a power systems and a human factors engineer. I can say that you know, those disciplines are both engineering disciplines mm -hmm. in the sense that we take what we've learned from the sciences, we define optimal outcomes, and we use engineering principles to try to, as much as possible, stay within the bands of optimal performance that we want and avoid unintended consequences that we don't want. Where things sometimes differ a little bit is that human beings are seen in somewhat of a different light and so because of that, sometimes we have a tendency to almost discount the human factor when we do really complex, critical, um, you know, life necessary activities. And one of the common mistakes that we make is finding something that is a really simple explanation. It just feels right. Chances are it's usually right until it isn't. And it's usually the moment that it isn't is the moment that you needed it to be right the most. So for every complex human problem, there's a solution that is neat, simple, and wrong. A lot of what I've done throughout my career is explain psychology, human factors, and you know, essentially to engineers, technical engineers. And so for those of you who um, you know, have power systems backgrounds, if I were to give you the example of closing a generator in 20 degrees out of phase, you know that that is really bad. The generator is basically going to chew itself up, rip, rip itself off the skids. The amount of you know, force and energy that gets released in an explosion would be humongous. We understand that as engineers, but sometimes what we understand less is when we create interconnections between people or create conditions within organizations, we can essentially have exactly the same thing happen with results that are you know, equally undesirable. So let me start a little bit with an example. So it was January of 2011. And at the time I was working at ERCOT, the grid operator for most of Texas as their principal human factors engineer. I was at a kid's party um, and another parent, you know, asked me what I did. And I said, I worked at ERCOT. And they said, oh, is that the place next to Disney World? <laughs> so fast forward just one month, February 2nd of 2011, got a call from a shift supervisor in the control room who said, we think you need to be standing in the back of the room watching what happens. For those of you who may not remember, on Feb 2nd, 2011, we had the first unexpected, really surprising cold snap that Texas had really ever seen. It was you know, re basically record electric demand because of heat uh, that all of the homes and businesses needed. All of these power plants that were essentially thought of and managed against you know, 100 plus degree heat were not able to withstand the winter cold. And very quickly, we got to what we would call a level three EEA or energy emergency alert, which is a load shed. Essentially what that means is that because you have more demand than you have generation available, the frequency on the grid starts to drop and drop and drop. And everything from the motor in your refrigerator to your dishwasher to everything else that we count on expects to be operating at roughly 60 hertz. 
If that frequency drops too low or too high, those motors may start to slip, may start to have problems. And that's just one example of many, many things that could go wrong. So from a human safety perspective, it's actually better to turn off people's lights rather than give them too low or too high frequency electricity from a human safety and wellness perspective. So by 6.30 a.m., over 4,000 megawatts um, you know, were shed from the grid, which means rotating outages. So many of you or people you know had their lights go out for at least 15 minutes during that time period. Now, that was 2011. Now, what's really kind of interesting, by the way, is a lot of discussions around how you plan for the grid have to do what we call the one in 10, which is if there's something that happens less frequently than once every 10 years, it's sort of not something we need to consider as seriously as something that happens more frequently than once in every 10 years. So from February 2nd, 2011 to the 15th of 2021, which by the way, is more than 10 years, we had another one. Many of you probably remember this one much more clearly. So again, we have now an even worse extreme cold weather, even more surprise in terms of the cold they thought would come their way versus what actually came. They started having to load shed even earlier, so one in the morning rather than five in the morning. And by the time it was done, 20,000 megawatts, or I believe that's five times as much load was, was uh, shed. Even worse because of other conditions like falling trees and lines and all of these other kinds of things, many people were without electric power for a really long time. And what makes this also really tricky is that as homeowners or you know, as, as students in dorms, all of the ways we live, most of us are on the distribution system, which means even if the grid is up and the wires that connect those transmission substations out to us are down, we still don't have power. So there's a lot of things that have to be right and have to be perfect in order for our lights to stay on. And so just as an example, to highlight how different these two days were, the one on the left is 2011, the one on the right is 2021. So a lot more freezing hours, a lot more challenges. And just to give kind of overall a sense of scope on just how different these two events were. So what does all of this mean and why would we be talking about it? So as many of you know, there was a huge public outrage that occurred after the 2021 and also the um, uh, 2011 EEA events. There was um, in the 2021, there were several companies that either went, had to go through or at least faced the specter of bankruptcy. Um, there were several people who lost their job there are a great many people, many of my friends got death threats. It's, you know, it was not a fun day. And one of the things I would ask you to keep in mind as you think about what it was like during those days is for the people who were stuck in those kind of situations trying to do the best that they could, a lot of their fears had become realized. But it wasn't like until that moment they never thought about this possibility. These kind of possibilities are the things that go through the minds of people who do this work every single day. So how can you be really successful in the midst of those kinds of situations? Okay. And so here's where a lot of the human factors starts to come in. Thank you. Um, so I'm showing here four pictures. These are called fMRIs or uh, functional magnet magnetic resonance images showing the parts of these people's brains that are active when they were in these scans. And these were some research projects uh, that have been done, some that I've played a part of, others that um, uh, colleagues had done, looking at how people's brains responded to certain situations. So I'm gonna tell you each of these four stories, and I know that none of you, uh, or probably few of you, 
are used to looking at fMRIs and and you know looking at what functional areas are being active or this, what it means, but just kind of holding your mind the question of which one of these stories matches which one of these brains. <clears throat> so one of these people has post-traumatic stress disorder after a life-threatening accident. And when they went in the fMRI chamber and the big magnet starts to go ka-chunk, 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 they had a panic attack and felt as though they were instantly transported to the moment that they were on the brink of death. One of these people watched a video of another person getting punched. One of these people was talking about an unfair situation in their workplace. And even though they knew it wasn't in their own best interest, they felt like they just had to do something about it, right? We even have this concept, we call it altruistic punishment. When you see something unfair and you feel like you need to just write the universe. And one of these people just got a call from their boss saying that they're about to lose their job. So as you look at these four pictures, can you tell which is which? Chances are no, and neither could any neuroscientist because the point is all four of these brains are doing exactly the same thing. There's an area in the brain, um, in the oldest part of our brain, in fact, we sometimes will call it the reptilian complex because it's so old, called the amygdala. It's where our fight, flight, freeze, or appease responses come from at our most existential terror. What does this tell you? For a part of our brain, it doesn't know the difference between you losing your job, you losing your life, and there are other studies that have shown it also doesn't know the difference between you losing a dollar and you losing your reputation. And what's particularly interesting about the amygdala is that we evolved to survive because the amygdala gets activated. When the amygdala gets activated, other parts of our brain shut down. There are other changes that happen in our body, way that blood flow is diverted. And, you know, for example, we're not digesting things as much because we may need more oxygen in our muscles to run or any of those kind of things. So imagine this, you're walking through a forest and a hungry bear comes upon you and starts chasing you and you're running for your life. How many of you are gonna be thinking about what you get for dinner that night or your taxes? Probably no one. Because part of the idea is that we survive because when our lives are in danger, everything else doesn't matter. We make quick decisions without thinking about long-term consequences. We run as fast as we can. But because we're not living you know, in areas where we're having to run away from bears or lions anymore, we do have quarterly reports, grades, midterms, you know, social rejection and other things like that. And our brain responds the same way. So how can we help these people's brains not act like this in these kind of situations? And the answer is from a human factors perspective, we first have to identify the risks. When you're afraid of losing your life, your reputation, your money, your job, your organization's lack of trust, any of those kind of things, chances are your brain is going to start looking like this. Just click. Just click off. Thank you. So a lot of what we look at from the human factors perspective is how do we create the optimal conditions for human beings to do what we, they need to do? and understanding where human beings have unique strengths and limitations. So one of them is making sure that people, for example, who are sitting in control rooms have what these people are missing right now, which is situational awareness. Now, while you look at this picture, there's actually some interesting stuff that's happening here. So you have these people potentially out trying to find some animals to look at. I hope that's all they're trying to do and they're focused. So they have essentially configured their brains to start stripping away unnecessary information so that the thing that they are focused on will get their full attention. Because they're doing that, they're not doing another activity called scanning. And because of that, they've missed a threat or an opportunity. 
Now, we can't actually blame humans because humans cannot do two cognitive things at the same time. You cannot scan and focus at the same time. We do not multitask as human beings. We can actually do something we call switch tasking, which is you do one thing, you pause, you do what's called a mental set shift to something else, do that for a while and switch back. The problem is if you do that a lot, you actually may have things like change blindness and attentional blindness, places where human beings make mistakes because they miss key information. You cannot have a single human being scan and focus at the same time. It's one of the reasons where if you ever watch a utility truck park, one person gets out and is looking at sort of the wide area view of the truck and the person driving is either focused only on them or now the training is to focus on one single mirror at a time and stop the truck to then move to another mirror and keep going until they get safely to where they're going. When you go into a control room space like this, switch tasking is kind of the name of the game. There's so much going on. You have video walls, tons of different systems. Um, this system operator is on a phone, typing on a computer. She's got a procedure right over there. You know, it's uh, unfortunately a fairly good representation of the kind of work that people in the utility space do. And it's exactly the same thing. In order to maintain the reliability of the bulk power system, you need to scan, you need to find problems. And when you see them, you need to focus on them and solve them. But part of the challenge is, again, you could be focused, especially on something that you don't need to be focused on. We call that misplaced salience. And when stuff like that happens, you miss opportunities, you miss threats, et cetera. And one of the other things that we have a tendency to do in this world, um, in this you know, high reliability, um, complex operations of electric power, is that we don't distinguish between data and information really well. Data and information are not the same thing. Data are numbers like 93.7. What does that mean? Information. It's 93.7 degrees outside. The sun is shining. It's pretty hot. I'm probably an idiot for wearing a jacket. You know, it's, it's about taking that number, that data, and putting it within a context to get meaning. And this is one of the things that we found as systems become more and more complex and complicated is that we can find ways of making information easier to build. Now, the thing is that information comes from humans. Data comes from systems. So even in the most advanced machine learning algorithms out there, if they tell a human being, here is what is going on, and the human being takes that and puts it within the context of something deeper they understand, they are still turning data into information. But the question is, how hard do they have to work to do it? And part of the idea then is that when you're solving big problems, that situational awareness is something that you need to have, not just within yourself, but with lots of other people who you're working with. And sometimes that gets really hard because when those other people are in different organizations or they even have different language. So as an example, electric power and natural gas are increasingly tied together because we have more and more gas units coming online and representing a larger amount of you know, fossil fuel generation. In electric power, a closed breaker is good. That means power can flow through the breaker. In natural gas, an open valve is good. It means gas can throw, go through the valve. In electric power, you have a switch, which is a device that can open only as long as no current is flowing. And in IT, a switch is a networking device that hooks multiple pieces of equipment together. It's very easy to find yourself making mistakes when different groups or different people with different mental models and understandings have to work together. Getting people on the same page is a critical first step to solving these critical problems. And as if that's not enough, the world is changing. So I started in the electric power world because I was an emergency responder in New York during the 2003 blackout. And um, 
understanding, you know, reading the uh, root cause analysis that was done by FERC and others that identified loss of situational awareness as the primary concern. It wasn't that technology failed, it's that humans who needed to understand what was happening and make really good decisions with great importance lost that understanding of what was happening. Things have only gotten more interesting since then, and specifically in two different ways, complexity and complicatedness. So the idea is that complexity has to do with things that are related to each other in ways that you don't necessarily fully understand. If you've ever seen those crime scene movies, you know where they have the, the push pins and the threads that kind of run through the room? Imagine you grab one of those threads and you pull. What pins are gonna get pulled? You don't necessarily know until you start to pull. We call that an emergent system because even though you think you understand how it works and you're mostly right, there are some nuances that you may not realize. Human beings are the most complex creatures on the planet. We've built the power grid, which is the most complex infrastructure on the planet. What could possibly go wrong? In fact, when you have a human being involved in anything, chances are there is complexity in it. Some people will even say that organizational culture is one of the most complex things we have out there. And many people will even say, experts who work on culture change will say, you don't even know what your organization's culture is until you try to change it. Because again, because of that complexity. Complicatedness is actually something very different. And that's something we engineers love. Complicated means you can separate things into completely disparate pieces that are totally unrelated to each other. So imagine you're driving your car down the street and every time you hit a bump, it kind of squeaks and bounces up and down and it's, and it's uncomfortable. Changing the radio station, or replacing the windshield wiper fluid does absolutely nothing, right? There's a few things that you need to work on in order to fix that problem, and you can forget about everything else. The human mind loves problems like that because at some level, even if you have a lot of variables, humans or at least computer systems can manage those. Complexity is a totally different thing. Now, the bulk power system, we call it a complex socio-technical system because in order for it to be successful, it has parts that are technology and parts that are human, and they all have to work together. It's about trust between the public and utilities. It's exceptionally dangerous. The number of things that can go wrong if you're inside a substation that could prevent you from going home that day is immense. And everything, whether we're talking about new procedures, new regulations, new public scrutiny, you know, people on social media, you know, coming and recording videos in front of equipment, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things can increase complexity, can increase complicatedness, can increase fear. And it would be really nice if we could solve that by a new piece of technology, but we can't. And it would be really nice if we could solve that by doing something to change human beings, but we can't. The problem because of its complexity requires a solution that includes all of those pieces and the kind of you know roll up your sleeves attitude because whatever it is we think we're gonna solve today, we're gonna find another problem tomorrow we have to continuously improve on. So how do we do all of that? A lot of it is going to come down to trust in organizations. Now, speaking about this from an organizational psychology perspective, there are two main kinds of trust, active trust and swift trust. The idea of active trust is that it's focused on relationships. People that you work with for a long period of time, you've seen them, you know them, they're hardworking, you actively trust them. High reliability organizations, we can talk about that more if you're interested, basically research on organizations that have fewer negative incidents and a lower risk profile than their peers in the same exact industry tend to have very, very high levels of active trust. Now, that is kind of normal operations mode. When you have an emergency, oftentimes the best you can hope for is swift trust because you have people who don't even know each other. 
The idea of SWIFT trust is that you have people who have come together with a shared agreement of what it is that you're doing. So for example, Doctors Without Borders would be a great example. If you go into a disaster area and everybody is on board trying to help save lives, but if there's that one person who just wants to be on the camera, you know, or just get likes on social media, that will erode trust very quickly and globally. And the challenge is that trust is neither created nor destroyed. It's just grown or shrunk based on everything that happens. You never get to no trust or complete trust and stay there. And so generally organizations, when you look how they respond to crises, tend to fall in these three modes, building trust, repairing it from damage, or trying to hold on to it and maintain it. When you also look at the environment that these people are doing their work in, one of the challenges we have is what kind of environments they are and just how hard it is for human beings to really thrive in them. And so this has to do with the, kind, the kinds of environments that we have. So generally speaking, there are few. There's a kind environment, which means you know very quickly whether you made a good choice. Imagine you're playing tic-tac-toe with someone. You're gonna find out pretty quickly if you made a bad choice, right? The game will be over, right? You have, you know, very few number of choices or possibilities. Things are, are very kind of constrained. There's only three by three grid in tic-tac-toe and you can only move in spaces that are free. Now, what's great about that is you can write computer programs to handle these kind of complicated problems. So for example, early computer games could you know, play at you at tic-tac-toe and usually beat you pretty easily. It took a while to get farther, for example, through things like chess. And there's some specific techniques like in computer science, reinforcement learning is a great example. Um, or in humans, we do pattern recognition and reinforcement in these kind environments. And it works really, really well. Anytime that you have feedback about you making the right choice, it tends to be a kind environment. A wicked environment is something different. A wicked environment is a place where you don't always get feedback. And if you do, it's not always right. And it may take a long time. So there are games like Go and more complex computer games, even ones like StarCraft, where I think it's every move is like two to the 12th possibilities or something like that. Computers really struggle to win at those kind of games. And oftentimes, if you make a choice, your third choice in the game, and you're now at a thousand, that third choice you made was the wrong one, and it's going to prevent you from succeeding any further a thousand moves down the road. It's kind of like if someone sets a relay in a substation with the wrong setting, and then 17 years later, there's an event that occurs because of the wrong setting. Is that tech even there anymore, you know, to know that it happened? That's what makes things so wicked. What makes it even harder is that oftentimes when you add politically charged environments, you start to get into a fiendish environment where you can't even agree on what success actually looks like. Is the success that, for example, you're saving as much money as possible or you're getting a job done as quickly as possible or is that it doesn't make the news media unless it's really positive? You know, you can have different people with different goals trying to put pressure on the frontline workers in the control room or the field to do different things. And that can make things really challenging because they don't even know what success looks like. We're also in, in a strange intellectual revolution, not only in the electric power space, but across pretty much our world. A lot of the way that we manage organizations come from uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor. And he was one of the earliest uh, consultants who came up with a book called The Principles of Scientific Management. And essentially what he realized is that at the time, you had someone who was an expert who would build something. So for example, you had an expert who made a car and they could make a vehicle once a week. And what he figured out is if you turn that person into a manager and they wrote procedures on what to do, 
you could then create a situation where you have lots and lots of less skilled people doing simpler things over and over and over again. That's where you get the assembly line. So now you're in a place where suddenly there's someone who only knows how to put on tires and another person who only knows how to screw in light bulbs. And in that world, it's really easy. If you are a manager wanting to increase productivity, offer a financial reward. In a short-term way, it will boost productivity until eventually it levels out. The problem is that most of those jobs have now been completely replaced by automation. Now, when we go to work, what really matters is the prefrontal cortex, the most advanced part of our brain. What we do is now focused on thought, not repetitive actions. If I offer you money to be creative, I am decreasing your creativity. If I offer you, a, if I tell you that you will get a bonus for getting something in ahead of schedule, I am increasing the chances of a poor quality thing coming in ahead of schedule instead of the thing I want coming in on time. And even as you go from generation to generation, you're finding people are looking for more and more meaning in the work that they do. People are not just motivated by financial reward, as, you know, on average as much as they used to. And that doesn't even include the whole cyber side of things where now you have computer systems and humans interfacing with them to do all of this critical work. It's getting more and more complex. And one of the ways that we try to handle that is through the addition of automation. And so I'd like to tell you a quick story here about this uh, graph, because I think it highlights a really interesting one. So the blue line that you're looking at, the solid line is the number of fatal airplane crashes that occurred that year. And the dashed line is kind of the trend down. The red line is the number of scheduled flights that took off. So if you're a regulator or you're just a person getting on an airplane, this is the kind of thing you wanna see. Over time from 48 to 2007, you have more and more flights taking off every year and you have fewer and fewer and fewer you know, fatalities or lower risk per flight. Except if you look in the late 80s, early 90s, you see a sudden jump up in the, in the number of fatal airline crashes. Can anyone guess what caused that? Any guesses? So it was the autopilot. So the auto, uh, excuse me, the early autopilot was a box essentially with a light and a switch. You flip the switch, the light goes on, the autopilot is engaged. At the time, pilots would joke that if the light ever went off, you either have 10 seconds or the rest of your life to figure out what went on and fix it. So we add technology, and unfortunately, we have a tendency to first add technology to solve a technical problem, and we ignore the human component of it until we realize later on that the human component was critical. What they did was called out of the loop syndrome. You essentially told a human being that he didn't matter because he or she was not in the loop on what was happening. There was nothing to keep them engaged. And so like all of us, we'll go do something else. In fact, a few years ago, there was a fatality. Um, a Tesla driver, his, um, you may remember this, um, he was an engineer and his car crashed, I think it was like 75 miles an hour into the back of a garbage truck, killing him instantly. Do you remember what that driver was doing when he died? Yeah, he was watching Harry Potter because now that technology that was in his car was also called the autopilot. And essentially the idea was at the time you could turn it on and it would drive for you and essentially didn't require anything of you. You didn't even have to touch the steering wheel every now and then, it would just autonomously go. And because it worked pretty much all of the time up until that moment, it was seen as infallible. So just like us, when we're a passenger in a car and someone else is driving, we're not paying attention to the road in quite the same ways. And so those kind of things can happen. As we rely more and more on automation, the kinds of automation we create and how we implement them become more critical. Uh, in order to prevent these kind of problems from happening again. We've been doing this throughout time, making these kind of mistakes. 
So the opportunity to create new kinds of technologies and automations that don't repeat these mistakes is a powerful one. We human beings are also in another way overwhelmed. Um, when you look at the number of, for example, phone calls that would happen in a control room or conversations, the number has steadily risen over time and operators are increasingly frustrated or distracted by all of that noise. And one of the things that that means is that operators have what they call less adaptive capacity. Think about adaptive capacity as what your ability, what extra energy or space or tolerance you have for an undesirable situation. So if you have to pull an all-nighter, most of you probably could right now. If you went six days with getting three to four hours of sleep a night, chances are it'd be a lot harder. Your adaptive capacity would get lowered. And when you have organizations that try to manage people to be 100% efficient, meaning that they're working at 100% of their capacity, see efficiency and resilience are, you know, you can't have both really strong. So if you have someone who's operating at 100%, what that means is there's 0% left for any unexpected thing. And one of the other things that we find is that the activation energy, which is how hard a person has to work to get something done, is also continuing to rise because of more regulations, more procedures, more systems, new cyber concerns. People are having to do more and more work to accomplish the same task. And that can also be really challenging. So again, that's why the bulk power system is a complex socio-technical system. Now, one of the things that is really important is that throughout not just electric power, but in our society, there are a ton of really good people trying to do really good work. And we human beings are predictably irrational, meaning that we do things that don't make sense, but we do it consistently. And we have a lot of what we would call cognitive biases, which get in the way. One example is something called the halo effect. It was originally um, studied in the Israeli army, I believe in the late 60s. And what they found was that people were getting promoted because they were really good at something, but getting promoted into a position that was totally different. So, you know, in other words, the one that I see all the time is you're a really good engineer. I'm going to make you a manager, and now you're going to be in charge of 20 people. Now, you can be a brilliant engineer, you can be a brilliant person, but managing people, just like power systems engineering, is a skill. It's not something you were born with, it's something you had to work at. And if your organization doesn't appreciate that or give you the training or the support that you need, you've been set up to fail. Another cognitive bias we often see, we call this the COBRA effect. This is kind of an, an interesting story that came out of um, when India was colonized. There was a national health epidemic where children were being, uh, you know, babies were being killed by COBRAs. And so the British government in an attempt to manage that um, created an incentive system. What they said is for every dead COBRA you bring us, we'll give you so many rupees. So in other words, you know, Let's start incentivizing people to kill these cobras, get them out of the, get them out of there, give them to us. They'll get money. Babies are going to be, you know, alive that weren't alive otherwise. And it worked, at least for a while. But over a period of time, the death rate due to cobras uh, on of babies started to rise back up. Government said, okay, maybe people have just gotten fatigued, like we talked about the uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor thing about financial incentives. Maybe we just need to double the award. So they doubled the award and suddenly the death rate jumped up. And then they said, something is wrong. We're just gonna pause this award system altogether. And the death rate jumped up even further. Can anyone guess what happened? Did people start raising cobras? That's exactly right. They created a marketplace for dead cobras. And if you want to effect effectively make money in the dead cobra market, turns out breeding cobras is a much better way than running around into people's homes trying to find cobras. And cobras require a lot. They're apparently very clever creatures who are really good at escaping. 
So you need people 24 seven monitoring those COBRAs. And if there's no more money to pay those people because you just eliminated the marketplace, all the COBRAs get away. So this is an example of unintended consequences. We have a tendency when we make a decision to implement something, we do so with a plan on what we want people to do. And then we create an incentive to try to shape them towards that. But human beings, for better or for worse, are very creative and may come up with alternate ways of achieving their goals based on the conditions you've set them, rather than the things that you actually want. As if that's not enough, human beings also have different times of day where we are more awake. By the way, thank you very much for taking time to listen to me right after lunch, when you are going to likely be the most tired and ready for a nap. I hope uh, I've either put you to sleep really well or not. Either way, uh, thanks for your time. Um, but understanding that we need a system operator in a control room, no matter where they are on this cycle, to do the right thing, to have good situational awareness and make decisions that will not only affect one life, but potentially hundreds of thousands of lives. Because in the back of their minds, that's what they're doing every day because they are. We also know that human beings, in order to function, require an optimal amount of stress. It turns out while we, are, we have a tendency to think that we will do our best if we're totally relaxed, that turns out to not be true at all. If you are in what we call hypo stress, which is basically your stress level is too low, you're not paying attention, you're bored. If your stress level is too high, hyper stress, that's where like things like the amygdala go crazy and you're making quick rash decisions without thinking everything through. In a control room, you have, for example, it's two in the morning and there's nothing happening and you're bored out of your mind, that's hypo stress. And then all of a sudden, the alarm bells start blaring. You don't know what's been changing. It probably didn't just suddenly go wrong. It's been creeping up towards bad until the alarm started going off, but you, didn't, you missed it because you were not paying attention. So now you have really poor situational awareness and you're incentivized to make really quick decisions you haven't thought through. Those are the kind of problems we want to use engineering principles to minimize the risk of those happening. Obviously, these human beings who are managing the grid are facing more and more interesting challenges. Um, a few years ago in California, there was a fire called the Blue Cut Fire. And it melted um, basically some wires on a transmission line and caused a phase-to-phase -phase fault. That kind of thing unfortunately happens from time to time. The grid is designed to handle that. But we found something new. It turns out that all of these inverters that were spread throughout California, most of them were designed to operate within a very narrow band of frequency. And when frequency was outside that band, they were programmed to shut off, wait five minutes and come back on. Turns out the way that some of those, those things measured frequency was a problem. That was one thing. There were lots of other challenges. But what it came down to is spontaneously when that fault occurred on one transmission line in California, solar panels that were on the transmission system, the distribution system on people's rooftops and community solar, all of it just spontaneously went away. 1800 megawatts of generation disappeared. But the problem was because it wasn't like a nuclear plants tripping off where you have one number that just changed and now you know what you're dealing with, you had, who knows why that happened? No one at CalISO did. And it took them a while to figure it out because what we're finding now is more and more pieces of the grid are happening at the distribution level. How many of you have a controllable thermostat, internet connected, right? So how many of you are participating in like Austin Energy or other you know, demand response programs or other things where your thermostat can be controlled as needed? So part of the idea is at the grid level, you have these resources that are so critical and they're now happening more and more at the distribution system. They're happening behind the meter inside your and my home. So how do you manage that? There's a whole lot of other challenges that you see people facing in that world. 
talked about increased distractions and so forth. We've talked about culture. And so let's also talk for a minute about this idea of resilience. Because at the end of the day, one of the things that we most want is resilience on the grid. So resilience, reliability, five minutes, okay. Robustness are three very different concepts. Reliability is, is it working now? Robustness is how hard does something have to hit the grid to take it down? And resilience is how quickly and effectively can it come back up? The primary source of resilience is human. And so in order to get that resilience, you have to make sure humans are in the right condition to provide that resilience that you need. That's gonna be things like creativity. It's gonna be things like collaboration. Things that can't happen if your amygdala is going crazy. Things that can't happen if you are working at 100% efficient. Things that can't happen if you're out of the loop and don't have situational awareness. So let me just sort of skip through a very few quick things. A lot of the conversation now in our society has shifted to the value of culture. And ultimately, you have a lot of different definitions of what culture is, I have psychology, you have some neuroscience-based definitions of culture and so forth. But what we know is that in cultures where you see you have good leaders, you have people who recognize you as human beings. This is what Google has done in their oxygen project where they're able to survey huge swaths of their population and statistically rank what, are, what makes, if you like your boss, what do you most like about your boss? Going back to the halo effect part from earlier, one of the things that you'll notice is the bottom item is the only technical item and it's barely at the level of statistical significance. So what makes for a good manager is a person who treats you like a human being, who is a good coach, who is supportive. And what makes for a bad manager is one who was stuck being that individual contributor that they were before they got promoted. So if we're going to engineer a better outcome, we need to start making better decisions in how we elevate people and how we elevate the role of culture and leadership in our organizations. And similarly with teams, the most important part of a team, oh, is that you? Okay, anyways, the most important part of a team is everybody agreeing to the same set of rules. It turns out that things like diversity really don't matter if, if the team does not get along and work together. But when you start to have people agreeing to the same set of rules of engagement, all of these other benefits like um, you know, IQ, people being friends, diversity, et cetera, really start to play a huge effect. And if I could sum all of this up, it would be this picture. This actually is real. This is a, a fellow in Canada who strapped a jet engine to the back of his car. And this is my metaphor for the system operator. System operators are the most dedicated, intelligent people I've ever met in my career. And they work really hard in really difficult circumstances, knowing that a single mistake could affect hundreds of thousands of lives. Their minds are like these jet engines. But if you take a look at this car, you'll notice it's on a cul-de-sac. So all of this thing, all of the stuff that this jet engine on the back of this car could do, it can't do because of the road the car is on. So in order to get to a place where we're moving into a more complex, complicated grid of the future, we need to make sure that we're giving these cars the right road to drive on. So with that, I thank you very much for your time. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Fresh course in human psychology. Any questions immediately from the audience? And for those of you online, I will be trying to look at your questions online. So, all right, we'll go to one question here. And Carrie, thank you for managing all of all of that. You're doing a lot of switch tasking, so thanks. Thank you. Um, this was really interesting. My question is, how do you manage unintended consequences? How do you plan for them? So there, that's a great question. Um, how do you manage and plan for unintended consequences? So within resilience engineering, 
So there's the idea of resilience in terms of being able to adapt to something you don't like immediately or as quickly as possible. But there's this other concept called anti-fragility. And the idea there is getting together and sort of thinking about what could go wrong. What's the most impactful thing that could happen that could go wrong? What would I do about it? You know, when Captain Sullenberger, for those of you who know the story of Sully who landed uh, the plane in the Hudson, he'd actually done simulators doing exactly that. So part of the idea is if you have people who are not operating at 100%, so they have the bandwidth to kind of think through the future, that's part one. And the other part is really a mindset of continuous improvement. In a complex world, there is no perfect and there never will be, because when you get there, the world around you has already changed. And so the mindset that when there's something that you don't want, an unintended event, you can either treat it as a screw up, a human error, or a learning opportunity. I've been in places where people who have made mistakes um, not only are not fired, but are treated like the subject matter experts in that mistake and have the opportunity to make sure it never happens again. I've never seen people that dedicated. So that's really, to me, the two answers, anti-fragility and a focus on continuous improvement. You just kind of touched on a, a question I was kind of wondering, thinking about uh, grid operators and your trade-off of being, uh, well, I guess, efficient, following procedures versus being creative. And uh, at the at moment to moment, uh, I guess there are procedures and following certain procedures are keep the grid running. And so how do we think about the trade-off between following procedures uh, and being creative? Is it just different time scales? And maybe your Captain Sully example was exactly that. If you, if you train for the scenarios, are you better able to deal with them in the moment? Yeah, I mean, training, thank you. Training is definitely a part of it. But I think the other part of it is that it's actually not a binary trade-off. It's not like you either have to follow a procedure and be sort of a mindless, you know, automaton versus, you know, just throwing stuff at a wall and seeing what sticks. To me, the most important question when you have an operator looking at a procedure is, is this the procedure or is this my procedure? In other words, the creativity can come in from those experts who are doing it every time, every day to build the right procedures, to make the procedures make sense. We have this thing called work is done versus work is imagined and this kind of gap between what the frontline workers are actually doing and what management thinks is happening. And the more that you have those people doing the work engaged in building and, and you know, increasing the robustness of the procedures, the faster you'll get to a point where that creativity is inside those procedures. And maybe the, I guess, Captain Sully landing the plane in the, in the Hudson in yeah, February, 2021, Blackouts here in ERCOT. Um, I guess, how, how do you think about the definitions of different people's, in some sense, definition of success or failure, right? I mean, uh, I look, I guess I kind of look at both of them, maybe it's because I'm an engineer and I look at them as pretty good success as people get off a plane. I, I don't think anyone died or even was seriously injured. And uh, in February, 2021, we did have people die, but the entire grid did not go down. And so I kind of look at it and say, well, this is, success in, in the face of challenging circumstances, but uh, how much is that a challenge in defining success or failure and, and do, due to different people's perspectives? I mean, all the ERCOT, you know, advisory board, you know, board of directors got got fired and we replaced them with only people from Texas. So I don't know, I mean, it sort of didn't make sense to me, but in terms of getting outside perspectives and different viewpoints, but any any thoughts on, on that kind of definition of success and Sure. And, and I think this is where the, uh, you know, the wicked environment kind of really comes into play. Because for one person, a political outcome is the correct outcome from an event like that. For another, it's an engineering outcome. And generally speaking, you know, with a lack of consensus, that can get pretty hard. Um, and I think there's also, instead of, instead of success and failure, it's really about taking signals. They're going to be really big signals like you know those February rolling um, blackouts, but they're also going to be lots of really small signals like you know a tour of a power plant noticed that their weatherization was running behind schedule, like how many of those signals were captured or on other parts of the grid, like in other areas, what are those kind of little signals that might mean if you took the time to take a look at it, 
that you're sort of creeping to an un, uh, undesirable position. So those situations while themselves might be bad, success is actually, I believe, in what we do with it, not in the, not in the outcome. Um, so in other words, um, and there's actually something called outcome bias, which is like, we have a tendency to look at the results of something as being a good or bad decision based on what happens. Like if you run a stoplight and you crash into a school bus and kill a bunch of kids, that's really, really bad. But if you run that same stop sign and don't crash into anything and don't kill anyone, you know, oh, you should get a ticket. It's not that big a deal. We have a tendency to think that way, but unfortunately that lends us in exactly the place you're talking about. Any other questions in the room? Yeah, I'll go over here. I'll ask maybe one as I walk to the person in the room. How much time do people and grid operators spend training versus sort of just the actual on the job operation and keeping track of things? Do you have any I feel mean, for that? Different organizations do it differently, but I've seen at least once every six weeks is a training week, sometimes more. Training week every six weeks? Uh -huh. Okay. Can you give any examples of uh, changes to the ERCOT operating procedure that are a result of suggestions you made? Me personally? Yeah. Um, or Resilient Grid, I don't know if they're a customer of yours. Sure, so yeah. I'm trying to think what, you know, what can I say on camera? Um, <laughs> so, no, I, I mean, here's what I would say. So when I was at ERCOT, I was there for a decade. And a lot of the work that I did had to do um, with emergency training, especially Black Star training. And so we've, um, through that time, you know, found some really, um, really critical things on the value of in-person training, of collaborative training, where instead of us being in separate rooms, we're having lunch together, we're talking with each other. Um, I, I've been in cases where people would get up and say, you know, I hope we never have this kind of event, but if we do, I hope you're on the other end of the phone. Um, one of the things you used to see in a lot of traditional utilities is different groups would get together, you know, they would, a lot of, for whatever reason it was, you know, hot dog barbecues on Fridays was a thing that I've heard from a lot of utilities. People would get to know each other. And then when the emergencies hit, they had relationships, they had that active trust. So, you know, that's not exactly specifically a procedure, but it's an approach to the way that we do training um, and having worked with some really expert trainers um, to facilitate those kind of events. Um, I would say that to me, those are, are the best examples because it's planting the seeds that will have the trees there when we really need them the most. Maybe we'll end on this final question. So, the grid is changing. It's becoming a lot more distributed. Um, do you think that operators are looking far enough ahead or I guess the system is preparing enough for this? Um, how does that change how you do your job and how they do their job? <clears throat> um, sure. So, and it's not really just operators. It's, you know, their management change and it's, you know, regulatory organizations, NERC, FERC, and so forth, the REs and RCs. Um, I think the short answer is yes, but it's hard because we live in, if um, I'm blanking on the name of this chart, but if you look at the acceleration of technology, like not Moore's law in terms of chip size, but in terms of the period of time it takes for disruptive technology to come to the marketplace, that time is continually shrinking. And so it makes those kind of predictions, you know, very hard. But a lot of what we're starting to talk about are things like, um, for example, let's say now your house is actually an energy resource. So you have, you know, a HEMS, a home energy management system that is bidding onto the grid, you know, and you have an islanding capable microgrid that's connected to markets. And, you know, in this kind of new world that we're starting to look at, you may start to see incentives that are going in multiple different directions. You know, the RC may want you to pause charging your electric vehicle in order to maintain a you know, frequency issue. And your local provider may want you to you know, turn on your air conditioner in order to manage a voltage issue on the system. You know, what do you do? How do you manage these kinds of different imbalances? I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of, of 
you know, conversation and struggle at the same time you have a silver tsunami, which is like a retiring workforce and, you know, new people coming in with both new ideas and a desire for new kinds of tools. Um, so again, I, I don't know that I have a great single answer except to say that everyone I talk to is really thinking about this problem and is aware that it's a problem and no one is pretending that everything is going to be perfect for the next 50 years, which I think is the really critical first step. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. Let's welcome again uh, and thank Mike Leggett, CEO of Resilient Grid. Thank you. Thank you.